Hi everyone, this lesson is an introduction into mutations. So let's start by looking at a couple of mutations. On the top, you can see one fly has antennae, one fly doesn't. You can also see that one fly has an eye and another one doesn't. So as we go through mutations, I want you to keep in mind what's causing this, what are they specifically, and are they good or bad? A lot of times you hear talk of a mutation being a negative thing or a positive thing. Are they either? Are they both? So let's remember the central dogma of biology. DNA goes to RNA, goes to protein. A gene is nothing but a segment of DNA that codes for protein. To be able to achieve that, during transcription, DNA is going to be converted into RNA, specifically messenger RNA, and that messenger RNA is going to be translated into a specific protein. Let's look at an example of one such protein, hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the protein in red blood cells that carries oxygen from the lungs to the body's cells. How do we produce hemoglobin? Through transcription and translation. The gene for hemoglobin is transcribed in the mRNA, it's then translated into different protein products, and then you produce the product hemoglobin that's about 200 to 300 amino acids long. With a healthy normal hemoglobin, you have a normal circular red blood cell. Here is the zoomed in sequence of part of the hemoglobin protein. We call it the wild type because this is how hemoglobin normally occurs in the wild. Here's a mutated version. You can see that changing just one later letter caused it to become sickle. The red blood cell has now changed its shape. This is a mutation. It's a change in the nucleotide sequence of the gene. If we change the DNA code, that's going to change the mRNA code, which has the potential of changing what amino acids are produced during translation. A point mutation is a type of mutation that causes a change to a single nucleotide base. And there are a variety of them. The first one we're going to look at is something called a substitution. A substitution is when only one DNA nucleotide is replaced with another DNA nucleotide. These can have dramatically different effects. For example, some of them are what we call a silent mutation. A silent mutation is when a base pair substitution causes no change in the amino acid sequence that's produced. Let's say we have a wild type codon of GGC that codes for glycine. Well, one mutant type could mutate to substitute the C for a U. That would give me GGU. But looking at our codon chart, that still produces glycine. This type of a mutation, where the mutation isn't felt, it doesn't produce a new amino, is actually pretty common. Here you can see another mutant, GGA, still produces glycine. Third mutant, GGG, still glycine. This is what we refer to as the wobble in DNA. If we change the third letter in a codon, odds are it's still going to code for the same amino acid. This is the redundancy that our code has built in. A reminder that we have 64 different codon codes for the 20 amino acids that make up life. By having this redundancy in the code, a lot of mutations end up having no effect at all. They're silent. Another type of substitution mutation is a missense mutation. A missense mutation is when a substitution does cause a different amino acid to be produced. For example, in the wild, I could have a code on GGC, but that can mutate to AGC. That mutation is going to cause a serine to be produced instead of a glycine. Some of these can be pretty harmful. You can see these two different protein products. It's now completely changed shape as a result of having a different amino acid. That's going to cause a change in function. But oftentimes, these will have no effect at all. A lot of proteins are hundreds of amino acids long. If I change just one amino, eh, probably not going to do anything. Third kind of substitution mutation we want to know about is a nonsense mutation. A nonsense mutation occurs when a substitution causes a premature stop codon to be read. Reminder that translation stops when the stop codon is read. No more amino acids are going to be added to the polypeptide chain, so the protein production is going to stop. A wild type, such as AAG, let's say codes for lysine, if I have a nonsense mutation, that can mutate to UAG, which is a premature stop. No protein product ends up being produced. That can be pretty detrimental if some function in the cell is requiring that protein to function. So these are our three substitution mutations. We can have a silent mutation, the change causes no change at all, the same amino is produced. 
We can have a missing mutation. The change of one letter causes a different amino to be produced. That can have a dramatic effect or no effect at all. Or you can have a nonsense mutation where you make a premature stop codon and translation itself ceases to function. Something to think about. If this occurs in an organism, what impact would this have on its future generations? And does it matter where in the organism the mutation occurs? So let's go back to sickle cell anemia. I showed you the wild type. We had GAA as our mRNA and produced flu. With the mutant, we mutated to GUA and now produced valine. What type of mutation was this? Well, this was a missens mutation. Here, I had a point mutation where one nucleotide was substituted, A was substituted for U, and I'm now producing a different amino acid. A little more information about sickle cell anemia. This primarily affects African Americans. It can strike about one out of 400. The reason why these cells are changing is that sixth amino acid. When it's a gluing, that is hydrophilic. It's attracted to water. But if it has a missense mutation and becomes a valine, that is hydrophobic. That hydrophobic activity is going to cause the red blood cell, specifically the hemoglobin protein, to fold in and create the sickled cell shape. Now, if you have sickle cell anemia, that can lead to some detrimental effects. It's going to be a little more difficult for your body to carry oxygen, and these cells can stick together. But sickle cell anemia actually has an evolutionary advantage. If you look at the maps up here, the map on the left is showing you where malaria is present, and the map on the right, the highest frequency of sickle cell. They overlap. Turns out that if you have sickle cell anemia, you are not going to get malaria. It's having the sickle cell anemia gene confers an advantage to survive malaria. We'll get to evolution later, but in evolution, all that matters is that you survive and reproduce. Having this disease can actually give you an advantage to survive when healthy individuals can get malaria and die before they reproduce. Now, I want us to think about how DNA is read. You can see the sentence on the top. It looks like a bunch of gibberish. But if I read it by three letters at a time, it says the fat cat ate the rat. This reading of threes is how DNA is read, a reminder that the mRNA codon is three nucleotides that are read, and each of those three code for one amino acid. We refer to this as the reading frame of DNA, how we read three at a time, and where we begin and end when reading three at a time. Now, let's take this sentence again, the fat cat ate the rat. Imagine if some letters were added to it. Now we have if the fat cat ate the rat. Well, I still have to read according to my rules, my reading frame of reading by threes. So now when I read this sentence, my codons are going to completely change. Instead of fat ate rat and the cat the, I have if f ak. It's a mess. This is what we call a frame shift. Adding or removing letters can completely change the reading frame or how we read these codons that in turn is going to cause a completely different sequence of amino acids during translation. One example of this is a deletion. Let's say one base pair is removed. Well, that's going to shift our reading frame. Here with the wild type, we had AUG, AAG, UUU. Well, now we have AUG, AAG, UUG. For all of the amino acids following that deletion, we've now shifted our reading frame and we'll have a completely different spelled out list of amino acids. This is tremendously devastating for the production of a protein because it's going to change the sequence of all amino acids after it occurs. An addition works the same way. If I were to add in or insert a new nucleotide, and this can happen in a variety of ways in the cell, that's going to shift the reading frame again. That can be very damaging if it happens in the beginning. It can even cause a premature stop. An example of a deletion is the disease cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is caused by a deletion right here on chromosome 7. That's going to cause a frame shift, and that frame shift has devastating effects. By losing that one amino acid, this directly affects your lungs' ability to move molecules through. Normally, lungs have the ability to move chlorine ions and water. That way they don't build up in your lungs' tissues and get in the way of gas exchange. In the case of this mutation, though, those chlorine channels shut down. That causes a buildup of mucus and bacteria in the lungs that the body can't remove. 
So unfortunately, individuals with cystic fibrosis, we have to use chemical treatment and physical treatment of trying to loosen all that mucus to force it up and out of their lungs because of this frame shift mutation. Without treatment, someone with cystic fibrosis likely will only live for about five years. Thankfully, with new treatments, we've been able to extend the lifetimes of people with cystic fibrosis up into their late 20s. So a point mutation, a reminder, occurs only to one nucleotide. It can be a substitution, an addition, or a deletion. But mutations don't end there. Entire regions of chromosomes can become mutated as well, and these have even more potentially detrimental effects. Here are the four most common. You can have a deletion. A portion of a chromosome can be completely removed. That's going to cause devastating effects based on where the genes are going to be read. You can also have a duplication where part of the chromosome is copied. Looking at the examples on the right, chromosomes are moving around in 3D space. If one chromosome folds over another, you can have an inversion where parts reverse order. Instead of this chromosome reading A, B, C, D, E, F, it's now reading A, E, D, C, B, F. And you can also have two chromosomes break off and change parts with each other. If they're non-homologous, this is going to cause different information to be exchanged into a different region. Since we now understand how all these different mutations occur, it's good to know how to be able to predict or read the code the same way your cells do to know what amino acids will be produced during translation. A reminder during protein synthesis, let's say I have the DNA sequence tag, the mRNA codon for that will be AUC, and the tRNA anticodon is going to be UAG, just following my base pairing rules. But I want to know what amino acid is going to be produced from this. Because there's only 64 possible codes, we're able to determine that using either a codon wheel or a codon chart. I want to show you how to read and understand both. Before I do something to always keep in mind when determining amino acid sequences is these charts and wheels only work with the mRNA codon. You want to always use the mRNA codon when trying to use a table or wheel to determine the amino acid sequence. So let's figure out these two DNA codons. Let's figure out for TTG and AGG what amino acid sequence will be made. First, we need to figure out what the mRNA codons will be. To do that, we just follow our normal base pairing rules. A goes to T, C goes to G. We do that for both genes. A reminder that RNA does not have thymine. Instead, it has uracil. So my mRNA complement for AGG is going to be UCC. So now let's figure out what amino acids are going to be produced. First tool you might be able to use to do this is what's called the codon wheel. Let's start with the mRNA codon AAC. To use the wheel to figure out what amino acid is going to be translated from that, I start in the middle of the wheel. My first letter in my codon is A, so I start with A in the middle. You then want to work your way out. So my next letter is A. The final letter is C. Going from the inside out, AAC will code for ASM. Let's do that again for UCC. I'm going to start in the middle, work my way out, and now I know serine is the amino acid that will be produced. Pretty easy to use the wheel. thing about the wheel, though, is probably not going to show up on your AP test. Typically, the codon chart is what you'll be given to try and do translation. Works the same way. You're just going to go around the chart instead of going inside out on the wheel. Here's what I mean. Let's figure out the amino acid sequence for AAC. With the chart, I'm going to start on the left-hand side, then use the top, then use the right. So my first letter is A. Using the chart, that means this row here is going to have the amino acid code. Now I'm going to go to the second letter, A, and use the top of the chart. Crossing those over, I now know it has to be where they overlap. So now I'm going to use the third letter, C. Beginning on the right and moving to the left, that tells me that ASN is the amino acid that is going to be produced by AAC as my mRNA codon. 
So what causes these mutations? Well, a variety of things. A mutation is just any change to a base pair in DNA sequence. We know that radiation causes this from the sun and from x-rays. Also, a huge variety of chemicals, drugs, smoke can cause changes in your DNA code that aren't caught and repaired. Infectious agents can do this as well. Oftentimes, though, it's just a mistake from DNA replication. During DNA replication, the wrong base pair might be added and it might not be caught and repaired. This also plays a role with age. As you get older, you're more likely to have more and more mutations. That's, again, because of mistakes in your DNA replication that build up over time and a lifetime of being exposed to agents that can cause mutations. So what causes a mutation? What are they? And are they good or bad? Hopefully now you're able to answer these questions, and if you're ever asked to determine the amino acid sequence, you'll be able to use a wheel or chart to do so. Thank you, and I hope this was helpful.